Hey, Lord, you are so good. Everything that we are could never comprehend how good you truly are. And I thank you for your word today. Inside your word, we find the absolute truth. And Lord, I just pray that today is, I've also written down some words and I've had some thoughts, Lord, that if there's something that I've planned on saying today that isn't from you, I pray that you would take those words from my mouth and my mind. And Lord, if there's something else that you have planned today that I did not plan on saying, I pray that that would come out of my mouth, that my words, my thoughts, my actions would be pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray for those that are in front of me right now, that you would open their ears, that you would invade the areas of their minds and that you might bring something new to them today. Whether it be newfound joy in who you are or a deeper understanding of your word or that you would just increase our brotherly and sisterly affection toward one another as we join together in this day of community. You are so good. Thank you for bringing everyone here. We, I don't know their stories, but you do, Lord. And so invite us into your presence. And we thank you that you're already here. Be with us through this message today. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Well, I'll say, um, my name is Chuck Connell. And to be honest, I am absolutely nobody special. Um, the Lord has decided to use me. And I have no clue why he has done that. Um, I had a life that was filled with brokenness and, you know, many of us, when we look back on our lives, we're like, why me? Why me? Why did I end up with this spouse that I have? Why did I end up with these, these great children, Lord? Why did I end up with this job? Why did I end up here this morning at this place of worship and get to enjoy Dunes Harbor or someone that's here serving you guys from Grace Adventures. And so um, I, I've been here now at Grace Adventures four times, and I will say the staff here is just incredible. And they're so kind and generous. And so if you just join me for a moment and just celebrating them for their time and effort into doing this. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. So I'm a youth pastor in Whitehall, Michigan. It's about 30 minutes south from here, and I'm here with my wife, Courtney, and our two sons, Isaiah and Matthew. Isaiah is five. He is on the autism spectrum, and so if you see someone running around or saying something that doesn't make sense, um, he's got some thoughts in his head, and it makes sense to him, and our two-year-old is in the class, which is giving my wife some rest right now. Anybody understand what I'm saying there? Right? We've all had young kids, and some of you do right now. Is there anyone here that's from Michigan? Right? Right? All right, there's no Spartan fans in the house, right? I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm not trying to make enemies early, but I will say, anybody a Detroit Lions fan here? Right? We got lots of Detroit Lions fans, and let me tell you, I was so excited to watch as the Lions did something that I've never seen them do in my lifetime of watching football, and that was make the playoffs and win a playoff game. And it seemed like things were going in a good direction, and I knew that last year was going to be the year that we win it all, right? I was so confident everything was coming together, and it seemed like the Lions had a shot to make it to the Super Bowl and maybe even win. Well... That did not happen. Um, and so I woke up and it's like, what next? Well, we know that uh, this last, uh, this year in April, the NFL draft actually took place in Detroit. And so it's all these people with their hopes in everything that they would dream of coming to the land of Detroit. And it was an incredible showing of people 
Roger Goodell was going to call um, 32 names on night one of the draft. And fans were there ready to celebrate the teams that were drafting based on their fandom. And so 32 people, day one, got drafted. Well, also, this year in Detroit, a record was set with number of people that came in attendance to go and witness all of these people being drafted. 775,000 people showed up in Detroit to watch this draft. And I promise I'm a pastor. I'm not a person that just talks about the Lions, okay? I'm going to get there if you're wondering. But can you imagine what it would have been like to be one of those 32 names called on day one of the NFL draft? It's like all of them have different backgrounds. They have different stories. Some of them gave up their rest and they put extra hours of effort into, you know, perfecting their craft, whatever position it is that they have. And these people were going to hear their names and move out of a life that was maybe the one that they hadn't hoped for, but move into a new life where there was hope and future and, and their dreams would be met. A new life that was much better. Well, just last week, the Lord put that story on my mind after um, we had finished a, a, a message time and a powerful night of worship on Wednesday of last week um, at a conference that we were at. We brought uh, 38 students and we had tons of believers and but we had some students that were not. In night three, Wednesday night, we had four students make first time decisions to follow Christ, right? Isn't that something to celebrate, right? And so, and it was so good, right? And I think about that moment with all these people showing up for the NFL draft and it's like, man, the celebration, I'm so excited. Well, the Bible tells us there's, that there's this huge celebration that happens when even one repents. And so what we did is we had those four students, as uncomfortable as they were, walk into a center of a circle of a small group, and everyone came around them and celebrated them like they were number one draft picks. And if you've ever placed your faith in Jesus, know that you are chosen. And you are called. And if you're here today and you haven't made that decision to follow Christ, know that there's still space to be a number one draft pick because our God is a rescuer. And this morning, we're going to find ourselves digging into Psalms 40. And I love hearing those pages turn. So if anybody wants to open up their Bibles to Psalm chapter 40, um, I apologize um, while you guys are turning there, I, I'm not going to have the words on the screen. I got back um, Friday of last week and um, Saturday spent the day building a sermon and then, you know, I had church stuff on Sunday and then planned this stuff. And so I don't have slides for you today, but you can find it on your, on your phones or turn in your Bible to Psalm chapter 40. It's almost in the middle of your Bible if you open it up. And we'll read verses one to three this, moment, this morning. But what we're going to see is David, like these students, like these players that had found new hope, David's making it through some tough moments in his life. And now he's going to move into a moment where he's saying, man, God, I need you to rescue me. I need you to rescue me. Give me a new song. And we're going to read that in Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 through 3. It goes like this. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. 
He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. God's word is powerful. God's word is awesome. And this imagery of the Lord lifting David out of this slimy pit, this muck and mire that his life had fallen into, and, he, and, and God set his feet on a rock. It was like, I don't have to just move through all this junk anymore. I get to stand on something solid. And let me tell you, Christ is that solid thing that we can stand on today. That's found in Christ. You know, the same Lord that did that for David is the same Lord that took me out of my muck and mire, out of my sin, and placed my feet on solid ground. And for many of you, God has taken you out of that same pit and he's placed you on solid ground. And for some of you in your stories, God is still eagerly waiting for you to cry out and say, Lord, I need to be rescued. Can you place my feet on solid ground? And so I pray that if that's you, that this morning you would know, man, God can rescue me from whatever it is whatever I need rescued from. God wants to do that for all of us. You know, I, I stand up here knowing that in my flesh that I'm not a great person and I have all this background and baggage that I grew up with and, and so it's just weird. It always feels weird when I get to stand in front of people and share about the Lord. I've struggled with my fair share of sin just like David in the Bible. And if you guys know David, I mean, this dude, he, he, he hit Goliath with a slingshot and there's some things beyond like PG versions that happen, right? Um, but David, he struggled with sin. It was something that he struggled with. Um, after completing high school, I joined the United States Army and I was in for seven years uh, my, my first couple of years in the military were interesting. Um, I had always longed to belong to people. And growing up, I was kind of bullied in different places and things were tough and we would move from home to home and it was just like, you know, poverty and um, different types of challenges that my parents went through and I lost my dad when I was 10 and so my mom was just searching in all the wrong places and um, I ended up moving out on my own at, at 16 and I found this little apartment. I was getting social security from my dad being passed away and my, my relationship with my mom was fractured. It was broken. And I remember going to my mom with a recruiter. I was 17 years old and I said, mom, you got to sign this. You, you got to sign this so that I can go away and I can find whatever it is that I'm looking for and she signed this contract for me and, and then I got ready to leave. But the group that I got connected with was not a bunch of great guys. They had habits, they had vices and me just wanting to fit in, I fell into those same habits and those same vices that held me down for a long time. And if you guys put thoughts into your minds, you could probably guess what those were. Um, but yeah, I struggled for years and years and years and some of these vices stuck with me for a long time. Some of the sin. Um, one of those I'm free of for five years right now today, uh, th th this, this, this week. And, um, and so God is just a rescuer and I just want to share with you 
um, that one day when I was in the military, I was hanging out with these guys and I decided to wear this necklace, this cross necklace. And the army chaplain, he looks at me and he goes, hey, hey, Connell, what's, what's going on? And I said, you know, not much chaplain. I'm just, you know, doing this thing and I'm um, just hanging out. I got this thing I got to do later. And he says, why do you have that cross around your neck? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, when I was 17, I made a decision for the first time to be a believer in Jesus. And he looked at me and he goes, no, I don't think you did. <laughs> and I, I'm like, well, what do you mean? And I was incredibly frustrated. And I said, um, you know, why, why are you saying this? And he said, well, I see the guys that you're hanging out with. I see all the things that you're doing. And to me, it looks like there is absolutely no fruit. And out of my frustration, I wanted to prove this guy wrong. And so I started to hang out with this chaplain. I stopped hanging out with this guy. I started to somehow find myself being mentored by this guy that would give me the wisdom to leave the military and take a step into ministry because out of, originally what, what started with spite turned into me recognizing that when I'm walking with Christ, when I'm experiencing his grace, when I'm walking in the newness of who he's calling me to be, it's like, man, my life can be changed. And the Lord rescued me from the things that I was struggling with. And I took the plunge to move out into a new life of ministry. You know, I learned a lot when I was in the military. It was a privilege to serve. There were hard moments. But it was incredible to be able to be a part of that. But God, God heard David's cry here in Psalm 40, and he came and he rescued him. God heard my cry of repentance, and he came and he rescued me. And again, if you are someone that knows you need rescuing, know that God isn't angry with you, He's not disappointed in you. He just wants you to cry out. The same God is coming for you. In these verses, we get a couple things here. We see that David is crying out. Crying is the verb in this, in this passage. And then we also see David is singing out and praising God. And this is a new verb. And the thing for David is he was known as a man after God's own heart. And I don't think this is because he was a man that just pursued the Lord every single moment because we see through the life of David that he continuously falls into the same traps. But what I do see is he has a posture of repentance and trying to make things right and go and spend time with God. It wasn't because he was so great, it's because he repented and he was delivered. The interesting thing about David is he calls the Lord his shepherd in Psalm 23. He knew what it was like to have the Lord as a shepherd because he himself was a shepherd. He looked after and he protected sheep. And if you know anything about sheep, they are not the smartest animals in the world. Sheep, they find themselves crying and in need of a shepherd to come and rescue them. And then they go and they leap for joy and not much time passes and they need to be rescued again. And we're going to have a quick video for you guys to see what this might look like, wherever that is. That's a pretty funny video. That's a pretty funny video. You know, the interesting thing about that video, we can, we can okay, we can shut it off. It's, it's going to be very distracting. No, um, I've lost you. The sheep uh, won it all. And so, like these sheep that get rescued and they quickly jump back into the same 
thing that they were just in. Just like David. We need to be rescued. And we cry out to God asking him to come and rescue us and then we rejoice until we are with the Lord at the end of our lives. We will not reach perfection here. We will go through this pattern of crying out to the Lord and being rescued and crying and being rescued, crying and rescued and singing and praising the Lord. But David, he realizes that something needs to change. And so now we're going to look at verses 6 through 8 of Psalm 40. It says this. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require, and then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, God. My God, your law is within my heart. And the interesting thing about this passage is this is what's known as a messianic prophecy, and you will find this exact passage written about in Hebrews chapter 10. Something quoted from Jesus. David moves from this life of crying out and praising, crying and praising, into realizing I can move into a new step. I can cry out and praise, and then I can live my life for him. Something is changing in his posture, and this is the same thing that happens to us when we're growing in our faith, knowing that we can move into this new life of just walking with him and submitting to his will. David says, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. I don't want to live for myself anymore. And we will see David continually fall into sin, but he offers God his life. He doesn't want a faith anymore where he just praises and sings and he, he wants to give all of himself. And Jesus in Matthew 16, he says, if anybody would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? We are called, like David, to offer all of ourselves to our Lord, to die to ourselves daily and follow Christ. We are supposed to say, my life is fully surrendered to you, God. And my hope is that we in this room are people that are doing that. David writes singing, God, you don't only want my praises, you don't only want my offering, you want all of me. And Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 10, he does this by, uh, you know, giving all of himself. Because Jesus died on a cross. Jesus knew that praising God wasn't going to do it. He knew that um, offering a goat or sheep or just his praises wasn't going to do it. He knew that he needed to go and offer of himself for us so that we might be rescued. Let us find ways to die to ourselves in the same way that Christ died for us. Jesus didn't need to die to himself because he was perfect. He died in our place, and so we are called to die to ourselves. Um, David, he moves forward, realizing he wants to walk with Christ, and he's excited about his faith, and something happens. And we're going to read from Psalm 9 and 10 what happens after he offers his life to the Lord. It says this, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. 
I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. David, he realizes that he has been rescued. He learns the process of repentance. He gives himself to the Lord, and then what does he do? He proclaims, he speaks, he shares that the Lord has rescued him. He speaks about the ways that God is working in his heart. And he goes and he tells everyone. Imagine if instead David wrote something different. Imagine if David has been rescued by God, he repents toward God, he gives his life to God, and he makes it out in front of others, knowing that God has rescued him. And he thinks to himself, man, it would be really awkward. It would be absolutely so awkward if I told anybody about this. Like, I'm going to keep all of this to myself. The saving grace is going to be hidden in my heart. And so, if Psalm 49 and 10 would have been written in an opposite way, in a way that wasn't Spirit led, wasn't put out by the Holy Spirit as it was penned onto this paper. It might say something like this I have spoke, um, I haven't spoken about your righteousness in the great assembly. I kept your faithful love and your truth to myself. I haven't proclaimed your salvation or mentioned your steadfast love and faithfulness to others, to anyone. I haven't proclaimed Jesus to anybody in the world. You know, this would be absolutely terrible because the Bible says that people know because we are sent to go and tell of his goodness. And if we're honest, if we're truly honest, there's some of us here that might look at this passage and say, you know what? David talking about, you know, not telling everybody and sealing our lips. That David guy, he really gets me. I couldn't imagine. That would be so awkward to go and share. I don't know you guys by name. I don't know the streets you live on. I don't know the church you go to. But what I do know is if the same hope that is inside of you is the same hope that's inside of me, was the same hope that's inside of David, that we're called to go out and we're called to go and tell everybody to shout it out to the great assemblies. Um, earlier this week, I got back from that trip and I decided to go to the gym at midnight and it's super late. I'm thinking it's going to be really quick and 12.50, I'm getting ready to leave and a student walks up to me that I haven't seen in two years. The student, his name is Liam and he says, hey, do you remember me? And I go, I recognize you, right? Is your name Liam? And he said, yeah. And we talk about faith until two in the morning. This conversation is met with tears and rejoice and singing and not, not literally singing. <laughs> but we rejoice with each other as we spoke of the things of the Lord. God wants to use you at all times, even the inconvenience times, to tell about his goodness to others. So let us learn from David. 
if you are someone that's here that has not been rescued, know that the same God that rescued me and rescued brothers and sisters around the room is here and willing and ready to rescue you. Let us live into this rescuing. Let us sing praises out to the Lord. Let us give our lives unto Christ who is the most deserving. And let us leave out of this place and go and tell everyone that we know that Christ is risen and Christ is Lord. Will you pray with me today? Hey Lord, you are so good. Your word is so good. We thank you for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. We thank you that you are never changing, that you are always true. We thank you for the hope that we get to sing of when we come and sing in a place of worship. And we thank you for your word that you've gifted up to us. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is moving in this place, changing lives. Let us leave here being people that live for you. And all God's people said, amen, amen, thank you.